from the AIBotShow.com. It's the AI Bot Show podcast with me, Carl Franklin, and Brian McKay. Welcome back to the AI Bot Show podcast. This is episode 13, but it's only the second podcast we've done because we started at 12. I know it's <laughs> hard to do math this early in the morning, but we try, trying to grok it. Hey, Brian, how hey, are you? I'm doing great, Carl. We've got a, we have a lot of news to go over this week. Oh my God. It's like the uh, Star Trek Enterprise just appeared in the holodeck is, is real. That's what it feels like, you know, overnight this yeah. happened. Yeah. Let's, let's get into <laughs> it. Um, Where's Barkley? I know he's around here somewhere. <laughs> um, I, I want to start with a quick recap of what was announced at the OpenAI conference. Okay. And then- talk about what it means and what everybody else announced because there's a pretty big news cycle going on right now. Yeah, serious hype cycle. So to uh, just jump right into it with the announcements, all right, so um, everyone who's listening to this probably already knows about these, so I'm going to go fast. We've Mm -hmm. got, uh, they announced GPT-4 Turbo with 128 context and 3x lower prices. Uh, First of all, forget the lower prices, that's great, but 128k contacts what does that exactly mean number of tokens available yeah that's the token memory? that's the token limit um and so it's it is so what does that mean that is one of the things mm. i want to talk about it's uh clearly aimed squarely at claude 2 which has a limit of 100k which has been outdoing open ai for a little while here but the thing is that uh that 100k is not really apples to apples and the 128k probably isn't either is it to refresh my memory? Is that the amount of memory that each conversation can have before it starts forgetting about it? Well, that's how if in the in the um, in Chat GPT that is what that comes down to. When you're doing okay, when you're doing dev work with the API, um, a lot of times when you're doing retrieval augmented generation, you have to figure out how to get some large document into your prompt. And you're having Mm -hmm. to do all this work of like chunking things up and putting it into a vector database and making your prompts more Mm -hmm. efficient. If you truly had 128K, that's a lot of pages of text. Like maybe I think Mm -hmm. I read uh, 200 pages-ish of text. Mm -hmm. And so if you really had that, you could could do a lot less chunking. And what it would really mean, what what all these announcements actually mean when you take them together is that Mm -hmm. a lot of the things that we're calling them AI engineers, this – burgeoning job title for people that work at the intersection of AI and software development. Mm -hmm. Um, They, they will be elevated by this because by, by all the announcements in aggregate, because a lot of these things um, take that work of like chunking and make it go away in different ways. Either they are, either they are allowing you to just upload documents and they're handling the chunking for you and making it just magically work or they're giving you larger contexts. And it just shows okay. that over time we're going to be elevated to work on more interesting things and not – All right. So I know I completely disrupted your your flow here. Um, GPT-4 Turbo <laughs> with 128K context and three times lower prices. Yep. Three times. Three times. Yep. That's a big deal. Um, Jeez. Yep. I guess hardware is getting cheaper and they're just finding out better ways to do things. Um, they're buying a lot of GPUs, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, so increased rate limits. That's a big one for me uh, and for a lot of people who are doing development. We've been hitting this 60,000 token limit fairly regularly with uh, our work. We just mm-hmm. fire off a bunch of API calls and we have to throttle them so that it doesn't overrun that. And then we have exponential back off so that when it does hit the limit, we retry. We wait a minute and retry. It's annoying mm-hmm. and it makes everything way slower. So our rate limit went up from 60K to 300K. Wow, and I actually found in the in the uh, portal there's a there's a clear like a tier system now where they unlock more power for you when you hit certain levels. So our next yeah. level is you know you've got to spend like a certain amount of money and like have a account with them for a certain number of days. Um, okay, so that's a really big deal. That's also uh, another you know talking about elevation, elevating devs. We were having to do things like. Um, well, like I said, exponential back off, things like that to just make it work. Um, our friend Joel Hewlin told me that, and this is a hack that anybody can still use, when you use OpenAI on Azure, the mm-hmm. limits are per region and there's like seven or nine regions. So Whoa. you can you can set up 
you can set up an instance, not an instance, you can set up a you can set up GPT-4 in each instance and the limits are lower. I think last time I checked, it was like 20K, but you can just round robin to the seven instances and get way Jeez. more total tokens. And like, that's another wow. thing that like, it, that's not really adding value to my product when I'm figuring out yeah. how to like game all this stuff out. So just having 300,000 tokens is awesome. Mm. And I can have, you know, twice that if I really want to by by going. But if, as time goes by, all of these painful things that we're engineering are just not going to be issues. We're going to be mm. we're going to be working at a much higher level. This will be a lot easier. Wow, Speaking cool. of which, the assistance API was released, which is awesome. What um, is that? Well, uh, so right now when you're working with the API, um, you're calling like the chat or completion API and you're just sending messages and it's, it's just like chat GPT. You're just talking to it and you have a lot mm-hmm. more control. Yeah. Um, the assistant API uh, allows you to first create a little, almost like a bot and you can upload documents to it and teach it how to call functions <laughs> to all kinds of things. Oh, man. It also can use, yeah, there was a, there was a demo during the conference where they they had a an app with a map like a google map on the right and mm. a chat on the left and as you're talking to it about booking travel it's putting pins in the map in real time and adding travel routes and things because okay it's it's crafting api calls and and firing them off as it's talking which is <laughs> so it's another layer above the api that helps you talk to the api no more efficiently not really it's a different api that's multi multimodal and it oh, has geez. yeah like so it has access you don't have to you don't have to say hey um get the document that I uploaded and chunk it and do things to it mm. so I can use it. You just upload a document and then start talking to it and it has chunked it and vectored it automatically. Well, you don't even see that. And part. so this is a, this is an assistant API that you use with the API. You don't use this with chat GPT, right? Correct. Yeah. We're talking about that right. stuff. Cool. Yeah. And, and I'm, you know, in chat GPT, there are some announcements there as well. Maybe they're using this behind the scenes to power their own stuff. Okay. We'll we'll talk about that. Um, so there are a bunch of API announcements. Um, Dolly three API, uh, there's whisper three, which is their, uh, speech recognition engine, uh, and text to speech with six voices. Um, all really interesting stuff. Uh, we could talk about how that stacks up against the competition, like 11 labs and others uh, on the speech side. Um, but that's, so does this really mean you've got, um, you know, the equivalent of Amazon echo, but with the power of chat GPT behind it, is that kind of what you're thinking? Well, I mean, we're going to get there and I'm sure, I'm sure Amazon is thinking about that too. Um, yeah, having I'm just sure invested $4 billion in Anthropic, and they also announced this week um, a limp. Well, it's a rumor, but they're rumored to be building something called Olympus, which is a $2 trillion parameter large language model um, that you would think that, that big. has something to do with Echo. <laughs> <laughs> it is big. Although these numbers really don't mean anything if you don't keep it in context. So $2 trillion versus what? Well, so so uh, GPT-4 is um, about $1 trillion parameters. And my understanding is that it's actually several smaller 200 billion parameter models that it uses together to cut costs and work better. Wow. Um, so 2 trillion, what I've read, I'm not a researcher, but I, I do talk to them. And what I've, what I've understood so far is that there's a point of diminishing returns with more parameters. So mm-hmm. Going above a trillion, you would think you would have diminishing returns, but things are changing all the time and maybe they've hmm. figured out something. So very interesting maybe. stuff there. Yeah, yeah. Yep. All right. So in DALI 3, you, you mentioned that. That's the image generation. Yeah. So there's just an API. Generator. For, there's an API yeah. for that. I think the assistant API can also generate images. It can also make files. So let's not let's hmm. not skim over assistance. One one let's talk about that just a little okay. bit more. Yeah. So sure. there's this concept of threads. So it can remember conversations. And then when you're, when you're working with it, you can, you can say, plug this into that thread or like threads are a, 
are an entity that it tracks for you, and that is the conversation so far. So you don't have to write the infrastructure for tracking the conversation. You just plug it into the, the thread. Okay. Is this sort of analogous to when you're using ChatGPT and you have all the chats on the left-hand side? Yeah. And you can come back to at any time? Sort of, but it's much more interesting from a developer perspective because you're always doing this chaining type of work where you're taking – you're taking a prompt and something the user put in, maybe some content and telling it to do something to it. A lot of the plumbing should get better when you're not having to track that stuff. But also it can be, you know, like if you're, if you're making a, a chat bot, um, it does allow you to just keep that stuff in the cloud, all the, all the conversation mm-hmm. history in the cloud and do something like what chat GPT does for others, for yourself. Right. So yeah, it could be that, but I see a lot of other uses for it too. Sure, yeah, I get it. Yeah. Um so just really powerful <laughs> um and we're just starting to see um as the week has progressed, people have immediately started building things with it at Roster. Um we have a little Skunkworks project where we have a we have a Slack bot that's trained on for now just our like employee handbook and some policy documents, but you can ask okay. it you can ask it like do we have Veterans Day off? And the answer is no, you don't mm. have that off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's pretty good at – but what I want to I want to do is be able to put information in there about things like in our app, um, like what is the icon we use for AI? You know, it's a little sparkle mm. and it's always it's a font, font awesome icon. And I mm-hmm. want that to answer with like the HTML tag for the full yeah. icon, you know. So you could put all that in yeah. there and just have this great – think about projects, you know. Like oh, imagine, know. imagine you're managing a project like – Say you say you are um, you have like some consultants who are building something for mm-hmm. you. I wouldn't know anything about that. No, we've both been consultants for <laughs> decades. Well, and we both managed <laughs> consultants. We both have. So just imagine writing a spec in such a way that you could upload it and then just give people access to this thing where they can ask questions. Like, mm. oh, I mean, mm, yeah, mm, is the answer. Yeah, it's just like that's lovely. There's, there's. Who knows what you can do there? I mean, it's so early. It's very exciting. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, uh, all right. So what's this next line? Uh, reproducible outputs and seeds. Yeah. I actually haven't dug deeply enough into this right now, but it sounds like, um, you know, a lot of – so it's stochastic when, when you're generating with, with large language models. There's um, – you know, my mother told me not to be so sarcastic. I know. And and that's that's been a real problem all my life. It's got me in trouble. She slapped me in the face once. I'm sorry. Because I was being so sarcastic. You shouldn't have had to deal with that. Oh, wait a minute. Did you say so castic no. or sarcastic? <laughs> Stochastic. <laughs> so um it's it works off so of funny. randomness. So so there's um there's a lot in here for managing randomness is what it comes down to. Mm. So Whenever, as as most people who listen to this may know, whenever GPT is generating text, it's looking at the most probable next token. And mm-hmm. then things like temperature allow it to say, well, I'm not going to use the next probable next token. I'm going to, I'm going to choose one within a range kind of. Um, right. But then what if you, um, what if you want to do the exact same thing again? Um, well, these technologies allow you to get closer to reproducing the exact same output, even if you have okay. a high temperature. And, and <laughs> so this furthers the illusion that it can reason when, you know, because, and this is an argument we were talking about, we were having, I don't know, last time, might have been in the, the one that we lost. But um, yeah, but basically the idea is that, well, it, you we anthropomorphize these things and it gives you inconsistent outputs. And, and that's probably because it's randomizing the temperature or something like that. But, but it is in fact just predicting the next word. And if, if the answer to the same question is different twice, then people tend to consider it unreliable. Yeah. Well, I mean, the answer could be only slightly different, or mm-hmm. it could be radically different. Which right, it could be different in fact, not in style. Right, and so on the topic of reasoning, this is a digression, but it's interesting. So researchers okay. talk about reasoning all the time, 
And reasoning is a little bit tricky to talk about because it feels like anthropomorphizing because we think of reasoning as a human faculty. Yeah. It is something that these models can do, kind of. When we talk about reasoning, we're really talking about solving a kind of a hard multi-step problem and getting to the right outcome, which it does sometimes, right? right? It it certainly does it with code. Sometimes. I mean, like, sometimes, like it. Yeah. Sometimes the code it makes for me is great, and sometimes it's terrible. When it's great, but, but that's because the actual developers have put that code in there, and they have reasoned through it. Right? Actually, an interesting thing is that um, so so the solution to reasoning, according okay. to researchers who I talk to, that's over it's a little bit over my head, is fine tuning and rag. So if you want to make tell us tell us again about rag. Yeah, so it's retrieval augmented generation. And when you're And we did talk about that, but I, I want a clear definition. Yeah. Well, it's just it's anytime you're doing serious development work with the APIs, um, you you are likely to be building prompts up where parts of the prompt come from some document or or some previous conversation or, or something like, for instance, let's say you're making a prompt and well, let's take my little, my little roster bot. That's my company's okay. roster. So let's say you're making this little bot where you want to get data from the employee manual. Right. Mm-hmm. And let's say, let's say it's the exact same problem. They, someone is asking, do we have Friday off for veterans day? Well, mm-hmm. how do you do that? The best way to do it would be to make a prompt that has the days off that we have in it. Right. Okay. Just embed it as in there as part of the prompt. Well, then you have to know the answer before you ask the question. Well, you have to know where to find the answer, which is the hard problem. So yeah. let's say you have a document that is our, in this case, our employee um, like handbook. That's where the mm-hmm. that's the document roster has that contains that information. You would need to have taken that document, pre chunked it up, stuck it into a vector database, and then labeled the data so that you can make a prompt. So basically, what happens is someone asks a question. A prompt runs that says, we've got all this stuff. Does their question seem like it has to do with any of these things? And the vector database says, this is the best match. And it pulls the chunk that contains that data. You take it out, you slap it into another prompt, and you add their question out of the end. And it's in there. Okay. And it comes back and it says, no, you have to work. Got it. <laughs> so retrieval augmented means that you take the output of one uh, of one prompt, right? The the response. And then you use that to, you, you chain it. It's basically chaining, right? You, you use that to create a new prompt and, and you continue that process. Yeah, that's right. It's this sort of amazing, really interesting iterative process of chaining. Mm. Yeah. It's chaining with, with content coming from all over the place. And that's how everything works. Like search, you know, any of these companies like Google and Microsoft, Bard and, you know, anytime they're doing search, they are pulling search results, parsing it, and then popping it into a prompt with rag. And that's how that goes. It's just rag. So how do we get here? Um, reasoning. I was trying to shine my <laughs> shoes and so, I needed to pop a rag in order to shine my shoes. So okay. reasoning <laughs> <laughs> to make, to make reasoning better, um, Rag and fine tuning are the two things that are just known to make it work right. And code, mm-hmm. interestingly, is like crystallized, distilled reasoning that they use. Apparently, it is the best source of a reasoning for training the stuff. Um, and and, and best way to create prompts is with code. Well, to to understand, like if you want to, so fine tuning. We haven't talked about fine tuning much. Okay. Um, and we'll, <laughs> I'll just use this to proceed to our next bullet point here, which is that they also sure, announced, they also announced fine tuning for GPT 3.5, 16K and GPT 4 experimental. Mm. So what is fine tuning? So in few shot prompting. Okay. Um, what'd you say? Few shot. Few shot. Yeah. <laughs> is that what I get at the <laughs> supermarket every winter? A few <laughs> shot? <laughs> no. No, it what is you not. you talking about, boy? It's probably not what you get for the flu. It's um, uh, First of all, how do you spell it? F- F-E-W, like not many. Okay. Okay. A few. Yeah, right. So, few shot. Right. So when you're doing prompt engineering and you're trying to teach it 
Like, let's say, let's say that you, let's go back to our example of, of uh, Veterans Day. Mm-hmm. Let's say that um, it's, it's a hard problem for some reason and it keeps saying something other than yes or no to that. Mm-hmm. And you want it to say yes or no. And it's, it's being weird. You could start to give it examples of like, basically you just build in more content where you mm-hmm. give examples of the user said this, we said this. The user said this. We said this. You make up what the user said, oh. added in there. And that teaches it very, very fast to answer things the way you want. Now, what's interesting is that with GPT-4 and when we switched to GPT-4, especially using Pseudolang, mm. um, I was able to go into a bunch of old prompts that had tons of few shot examples and remove all of them. No prompt in roster has any few shot anymore, which is crazy. I'm probably going to add some soon just to fine tune stuff. But so I thought <laughs> few shots would make a, a prompt more powerful or more easier. Basically, it sounds like what you're doing is just distilling down um, some conversation into its absolute necessary parts. Well, no. Well, with few shot, you're t- you're training it. You're training it to answer the way you want it to you want to answer it. So oh, bef- I see. So before with GPT 3.5, I had to have a bunch of examples to get the right output with GPT four. Our prompts can be much smaller and cheaper and faster by mm. just removing all that stuff. And there's only, it. it looks like there's going to be a couple of cases where we have to add some examples back in. But to mm. me, it was, it melted my mind when I realized I can just remove all this stuff and it still works. Oh Hang on. God. I got a sponge around here somewhere. Let me, let me find it. <laughs> Maybe a mind? towel. Yeah. Yeah. That's twice that now up. that something has melted my mind in this conversation. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, fine tuning is where you, um, it's similar to, to few shot where you're, you're kind of giving it examples with few mm-hmm. shot. Maybe you take 50,000 or 200,000 examples of if this input, then this output mm-hmm. and you train it on, you basically make a spreadsheet with all these inputs and outputs and you upload it to GPT and they train a custom model that is fine tuned with that. And what that does is it makes it super good at whatever kind of reasoning or it's the way you make it reason the way you want it to reason for some task. I see. So like, say you had some really complicated domain, like I, you know, you're, I see your recording studio in the background with all the equipment. Mm-hmm. Let's say you had mm-hmm. like a thousand recording studios all over the world and mm-hmm. it's just too much for rag for some reason, too much for few shot. Like you couldn't make it work. You could maybe fine tune this huge model with a, you know, couple hundred thousand questions about what kind of symbol is on my pearl drum set at location right. five in New Zealand. And it would just soak all that up. And then with, with very little prompting, it would just work. So what you're saying is you don't have to match those exact questions, but, um, it, but it, it basically learns these facts and then, uh, Am I right about this? Does it learn these facts and then sort of integrate them into its answers? Yeah. Well, you're showing it examples of of how to respond to prompts, and it's very good yeah. at learning from them. I'm surprised we haven't gone over few shot prompting. And maybe because GPT four is so good that it's not always necessary anymore. Now this is the first time I've heard you say few shot. Oh wow. Yeah. All right. Well, it's a big deal. <laughs> Yeah, it is a big deal. And it, it's almost like um, taking a shortcut to a vector database, isn't it? It seems to me. Well, the problem with fine tune, here's the difference. And here's where there's a lot of trade off between these things. Fine tuning is not something that. So, first of all, fine tuned models are more expensive, they charge you more for them. Um, okay. And, and also, they are kind of static. It is not going to change once it's fine tuned. So if something changed in your data, so it's not real time, okay, mm-hmm. but a vector database could be. I see. You could be updating the vectors, the data in the vector data. It is a database. Subtle, subtle differences here in how to take data that you have and get it into a model. Yes. So that's three things, right? You have the few shot, you have fine tuning, and you've got vector databases. And RAG, don't which yeah. we. And RAG, yeah, yeah. And we really haven't even talked about vector databases yet, mostly because they're very technical, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Um, they are, and 
I honestly have barely used them. And right mm-hmm. here, as we are about to get to where I I'm reaching towards them, technology mm-hmm. is coming out that abstracts them. So, so maybe the future is not a future where developers are building their own vector databases. Yes. Okay, Brian, hold that thought because we're going to take a moment here for some very important messages. And we're back. You're listening to the AI Bot Show podcast. I'm Carl Franklin. That's Brian McKay. Hey, Brian. Hey, Carl. And during the break, you noticed that there's a new announcement about something. What is it? Yeah, there was just an announcement yesterday that kind of goes into this topic. You were mentioning vector databases, and I was saying um, I, I'm about to start really using them, but I see that they're being abstracted away. Mm-hmm. At the same time, Pinecone just announced yesterday um, Canopy. And Pinecone is a vector database platform, right? Yeah, they're like a cloud-based vector database platform. They now have like integrations with um, Azure, so you can use them. You can host your own on Azure. Um, mm-hmm. So this is um, something that allows you to get a RAG-powered application, quote, up and running in under an hour. Um, wow. Yeah, it's free up to 100K of embeddings. It's, it's just another interesting uh, take on this. Um, so the minute that OpenAI is abstracting vector databases away, this vector database comes up with an answer that's quite interesting. An abstraction over its own vector database. It looks platform. that way. Yeah. There. Yeah, yeah. So there's there <laughs> there are going to be a lot of ways to go with this. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Other other interesting things. Um, for me, copyright shields interesting because my business is building on on this tech and and basically what mm-hmm. they're saying is there's a legal fund. So if you get sued um, for using their technology, they'll help you out. Um, and the final thing is that knowledge has been updated. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on a second. Let's. So I'm not sh- when you said copyright shield, I thought like, um, you know, if you're a creator from a creator's perspective and um, Dali has crawled your online images and used it in something, right? I thought a copyright shield would prevent Dali from ingesting your content. That's what I thought. No, that's but, not what but this what is. what you're saying is this is from the, the programmer's perspective or the, um, not the creator's perspective, but somebody who's using Dali, let's say, and you, you know, some artist says, "Hey, that face comes right out of my painting, and here's my painting. I'm suing you." This is what this is all about. So the quote from Sam Altman at the keynote was, "Copyright shield means that we will step in and defend our customers and pay costs incurred if you face legal claims for copyright infringement." Wow. Yeah. So if you accidentally infringe and get sued, they will they will help you out. Which just makes it the idea is to make it easier to adopt this. It's it's right. to address those concerns that organizations are having. Is there any news from the US government in terms of um trying to protect creators? Cuz you know, I'm both. I'm I'm a user of AI, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm a creator of content and I certainly don't want any of my music let's say showing up in somebody else's video because uh, some AI told it that it was fair game. I would say there hasn't been a lot of new movement there. Last week was a big week for that um and I mm-hmm. say big it was more like the ball got rolling it seemed right and it's a yeah. it's going to be a slow it should be – it's tricky because it should be a slow process because feeling out how to do that right is really hard. But yeah, also it I needs know. to be in place now because creators are are suffering. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nothing – nothing. Uh, not a lot of new news on that front this week though. Um, can we dive into some of these things? That's the list. Um, you began talking about the 128K contacts and you also brought up Claude 2. So remind us what Claude is and what what's the uh, difference here with um, the new GPT-4 Turbo and Claude 2. Yeah, okay. So um, Claude 2 is from Anthropic, which is a competitor mm-hmm. to OpenAI, um, mm-hmm. one of what appears to be many, many competitors that are emerging. We'll talk about right. all the announcements for new models. And you also just mentioned that Amazon is investing bazillions of dollars into Anthropic, right? Yep. 
Amazon invested four billion, and I want to say Google invested two billion, where they announced the investments. Hmm. Um, the thing, the interesting thing about Anthropic is that they were funded by, oh, that crypto mogul who went under, uh, Sam Bankman Fried. Um, yeah, he was funding it for a long time, and all of his money went bye bye. So I think they were scrambling a little bit to get funding, and funding they found. So, mm. um, they'll have about six billion dollars at least, and um, OpenAI has about ten. So that's well, where you that know, is. if a criminal invests in it, it's probably a good idea. <laughs> well, he was a he was a well-meaning <laughs> fraud. <laughs> Oh, come on. You're going to defend that guy? <laughs> no. Well, I don't know. I watched the whole thing about him. I think he started out in a good place and then just got totally yeah, corrupt. Yeah, of course he did. He yeah. just got corrupt. Yeah. yeah. I, I, just because he invested in it doesn't mean that it's bad is my point. I, it's a dude, total joke. Yeah. So Claude 2 is not as strong as GPT-4 by most accounts that I've heard, all accounts okay. that I've heard. Um, but the interesting thing about Claude 2 is that it has a context of 100,000 tokens. And the question is immediately, how is that possible? Because Mm. context is quadratic, which means that um, it it gets very expensive as you scale up. Um, Right. So so there have been some people who have looked at this and tried to understand what they're doing. And a lot of people say they're probably using something called sparse attention, which is more of a researcher – level idea. We don't have to get into it, but it's not the same technology that you typically see um, in like the 8K GPT-4. And what happens is that as you get higher into the context, accuracy tends to break down um, hmm. quite a bit where at the upper nosebleed area of it, it's 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 quite a bit less accurate and less usable. And, and now what's interesting is GPT-4 Turbo announced that it is matching the the context size, well, right? exceeding it, of course, at one hundred twenty eight. One hundred twenty eight. Yeah, that's yeah. clearly one up in Claude too, a little bit. That's the idea there. <laughs> but is GPT four Turbo going to suffer from the same inaccuracy problem? At uh, you know, once we get to um, what does it say? The perf started to degrade at seventy three thousand tokens. Well, so so this is so it's not accuracy though. That's performance. So Greg Comrat. Um, mm-hmm. on on X posted about pressure testing um, the 128k context for GPT for Turbo. Okay, and what he found, I, I think it's it's kind of hard to get apples to apples comparison between the two models at this point, but it looks mm. pretty promising. So performance started to degrade at around seventy three thousand tokens, which is right in the middle. No, that's mm-hmm. not that's not right. He had a hundred percent recall up to sixty four k tokens. What does that mean? So they did something called a needle in a haystack analysis. And that's where you upload, you basically stuff the prompt with a huge amount of information that it's, that mm. it, it's our, the model's already trained on and you make mm-hmm. small changes to it and you ask it where the changes are and oh. finding that needle in a haystack tells you how good a job it's doing of understanding what it's trained on. I see or what you've, what you put into the prompt rather. Okay. So, so they trained it on a whole bunch of um, of Paul Graham essays and just tweaked a couple words. And so basically at um, 64K, they had a 100% hit rate. In other words, it worked great. It worked great 100%. up to 64K. Every single time. Yep. And then yeah. after it, – it starts to fall apart more after 73,000. And, um, you know, if – even with – uh. Even with using the huge context, if the fact was at the beginning of the document, it always worked regardless. So it could be 128K, but if the fact is right at the beginning, good to go no matter what. So it clearly starts – it clearly is using something else to to manage the tail. Um, and so so I think it's uh, it's interesting. And there's a – I found a uh, a post from Anthropic. Um, from a couple of weeks ago where they talked about how to improve recall over large contexts where they know mm. that their 100K context sort of falls apart at the end. And there were two really interesting examples. We'll link to this in the show notes, but just in a, in a nutshell, um, extracting reference quotes relevant to the question before answering is one tip. 
and supplementing mm-hmm. the prompt with examples of correctly answered questions about other sections of the document also prop it up. So examples of correctly answered questions, that's probably like a few shot type. Right. You right. Know, something like that. Or maybe it just goes into the system prompt. Anyway, uh, there's a whole write up about it. Um, it's interesting. So what that means to me is that working with 128 K context is going to be very similar up to 64 K. And then if you want to really push it, it'll, you'll have to use special techniques and understand what you're doing. Also interesting that the guy spent $200 in API calls doing this and <laughs> a single 128 K call cost a dollar and 28 cents, <laughs> which is a lot. I, I, yeah. But you know, it's less than a cup of coffee. Oh, way less, <laughs> way less where I live. <laughs> That's less than the tip. <laughs> tip less than that in Portland and you might get shot. <laughs> Welcome to the AI Bot Show, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking about coffee and tips. Welcome back. Um, yeah. So I don't, do you remember the paper? Um, it seems like it was months ago, which is a lifetime and in uh, large language model time where Google it was a leaked paper from Google where they, they did some internal analysis and they said, we have no moat um, because of open source models. They're coming and they're going to be good. And we have no defense and open AI also has no moat. They were talking about their like business, like defending their business from open source. Like, like they were saying, we have, a, we have large language models and we can, we can sell them. We can make money on them, but these open source models are going to come and, and eat our lunch. How, how do we – we have no defense and open AI doesn't either. I see. Yeah. So this is the moat. Like what we're seeing here is all these extra value-added things that are going onto the model are how you have a closed for-pay version of something that will eventually be out there for free. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's all this extra stuff. And – there are tools like prompt layer and human loop that I've been looking really closely at. And we're, we're using prompt layer now. Um, I noticed that they all use UI patterns, very similar to what open AI uses. And I've got to think that we might expect an acquisition of one of them soon. Um, hmm. I don't know what either of those things are. I never saw them, but we'll, we'll add links to them. Prompt layer. Is it uh, in human loop? Are these sort of uh, chat GPT? kind of things. So just like with software where, you know, it used to be the wild west and now we all have these stacks and technologies that are pretty standard across devs. Um, mm-hmm. There are going to be stacks of technology that people use for prompt for uh, AI engineering. And one part of it is this middleware. So prompt layer and human loop are both middleware that sit in between. Well, they sit differently in some cases, not necessarily in between. Basically though, when you make it a call to open AI, one way or another, this service gets notified that you've done this. They might even make the call for you in the case of human loop. And when they make that call for you, it goes into their tracking architecture. So they, they're they they're doing all this monitoring and keeping track of like how healthy your responses are, how much you're spending your tokens. Hmm. Um, and when you're doing chains, you know, like building their, their versions of this is better than what you would build for yourself. We have a really crappy version of this. We're, we're tossing it and using prompt layer because they're, they're reasonably priced. Um, okay. But it allows us to say, okay, over this prompt that involves this, this chain that involves six steps, we can tag that so that it all goes up there together. And, and you can see everything that happened. You can, you can backtrack. You can understand if something's slowing down. Most importantly, this is a really important thing to learn from the announcements too. One thing that is really clear is that you know, this announcement that the models are updated to April 2023, that's great. It's a big deal. Mm. However, the model has changed. <laughs> you know, the, the model, that means that that means they are definitely changing the model. Like we knew that. Right. But it's important to it's important to know it it, it impacts how we work to understand that the model we're basing everything on changes. Like yes. my prompts are tuned. They're doing such specific yeah, work. I get it. Like a couple words, sometimes a couple words is what makes the magic happen. So if the prompt mm. is shifting under our feet, we need regression tests, just like software developers. Right. Use. So these companies both have these evaluator things where you can upload a data set 
and they have your prompts and you can basically run unit tests where a bunch of examples go through their system and you evaluate whether the result was right. Wow. And that's important and not a part of my stack currently. It will be in a few weeks. And that's as we move forward and this becomes more of a discipline, I've got to think that that type of technology is going to be a critical part of it that in a year or two, everyone's going to use it. And if you don't use it, you're a caveman. So are people already building stuff? I know you've uh, started a new project, but do you, are there other public projects that are going on that people are using GPT-4 Turbo? So on the Twitters or the Xs or whatever we call it now, um, I saw some really cool things people have slammed together. One was they they used the Assistance API to apparently look at a soccer game and do a live, really good voiceover that explains what's happening in the game. And it's like, oh, man, oh, he's he's facing their entire defense. He just faced down three guys. Oh, he scored. Go, go. You know, it's like it's like pretty good. Right, that bugs me. That bugs me because I want the real guys up there in the box making jokes and doing color, you know, kind of like we're doing. Right. Yeah. So somebody's going to read all this stuff and make a podcast that replaces us, man. We got to be good. We got to be good. And we probably have to sometimes use the tech, right? (laughs) I think it'll just, there goes another job. (laughs) It's, 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 uh, it's going to be a while before it's able to. um, Yeah, I get it. Yeah. But it is pretty cool that, you know, you could see that. Yep, and there was you know, another. Especially if you're watching a um, a foreign soccer game, and the announcements and all that stuff is in Spanish, mm. it would be cool to just say, "Hey, you know, AI, give me a play-by-play in English." Yes, that would be really cool. Um, mm-hmm. Another really interesting one I saw was a yoga posture corrector, where this person's doing hmm. like downward facing dog, and it tells them bend your knees more, you know, elongate your hmm. spine. Um, okay. This has got my brain going because at one point when I was programming the Microsoft connect, you know, mm -hmm. one of the projects that I wanted to do, and it was completely out of my league was, uh, you know, something where there's a camera on me throwing a dart at a dartboard. And then there's a camera at the dartboard that tells that, you know, shows where, where the dart landed and then have some sort of neural network that, looks at your posture, looks at everything that you're doing, you know, sees what your posture is when you when you hit the bullseye, when you hit what you're going for, and what it is when you miss. And can correct you as you're sort of in stance saying, you know, you're dropping your right shoulder, pull that up, or, you know, you're mm. standing with your legs too far apart, um, you know, you're leaning forward too much, right? Yeah. Isn't that cool? I, yeah, I, I got a, you've got me thinking now too, because if you had two sources of video or multiple sources, you could mm-hmm. run something on both of them and then aggregate the result and do something sort of interesting. Yeah. You would first get the video of the throw, the posture and the throw, and then you get the video of where it landed. And then you don't need the video of the dartboard anymore. You know, you know where it landed right. and you can just use a single frame um, as the result. Yeah, and maybe you could even pass it through something else that that uh, annotates your posture mm. in a different way too. I, I don't know what's out there, but you've got. I've got to think that there are some real magical possibilities with with that type of idea. And and not only darts, but you know, real sports too, right? You know, basketball. Oh How man, come I can't shoot a basket. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The amount of the amount of instrumentation they have on baseball players now is uh, is pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, sensors they put on pitchers and tests like, oh, you should maybe take a day off because this is 20%. You know, it's golf, for, golf. Yeah. Holy crap. That'd be very fine, very fine details. I'm doing, I'm in yeah. like, uh, I've been doing some physical therapy just to like fix my, fix my body and like the fine mm-hmm. details that I get from, I don't know if they could do that. Like the level of mm. fine detail that I get from my, my PT. I don't know. Um, I don't know if they could do that, but it would be maybe, uh, you Connect know, something's pretty accurate, man. Yeah. Yeah, Oof. yeah. You went deep on Connect. I know you were. Uh, mm-hmm. You were super yeah. deep in that. I mean, those are floating point values um, for all of those joints. Oh. Thirty frames per second. Wow. Every joint. Oof. Yeah, the things that like game developers are doing intersecting with this could be so strong. Mm. Okay, let's get into. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so all kinds of cool things coming and more to come. I'm sure. Um, yeah. Other things. Um, 
So on the chat GPT side, um, this is not really for developers. And I want the show to be more focused on developers, but worth knowing that there's a big announcement about agents called GPTs and a GPT, GPT store coming later this month that- What? Yeah, it's there's a builder. Um, you can go in there and make, you'll be able to make a little bot, train it with um, secret knowledge and put it out there. And the best ones will possibly make you money. They said that wow, there's a way to make money for some users. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. So if you can think of some data set or API that's out there, you could connect it to one of these and make some money. I certainly can. I'm not going to say what it is, but I certainly can. <laughs> Maybe he'll tell me <laughs> offline. Um, there was also a series of outages from OpenAI this week, which seems to happen every time they do something yep. new. And Sam Altman tweeted about it yesterday. He said, um, TLDR, uh, they had a huge surge of usage, way outpacing what they expected and expect more instability in the short term. Yeah, I was uh, I was in the middle of a conversation with GPT about some code, and it just said, there seems to be a problem. Try later. And then I looked on uh, the, you know, is basically say, is chat GPT down? Googled that and it landed on a document that said, yep, it is. Yep. Uh, it was and- down for a couple hours, right? Yes, and the API was down too. It messed us up a little bit, and it was fine. Um, what that means to me is that in the future, we'll we'll be building this out so that we can fail over to other models, so we're not just dead in the water right. if one goes down. Um, and he also said we're planning on we're planning to go live with GPTs, which we just talked about for all subscribers Monday, but still haven't been able to. We are hoping to soon, which just means they are wow. they are getting such a surge that it's just impossible to keep up. All right, let's talk about yours and my favorite mad business owner and a generally crazy guy, Elon Musk. Uh, yeah, so so like what was it? Two two days or one day before the this OpenAI conference with all these announcements, he launched uh some sort of AI thing called Grok. G R O K. What the heck is that? Yeah, so this this goes in the category of new models. Um, a bunch of new hmm. models have either been announced or launched this week, and so Grok is Elon's. So it, he has this company called XAI, hmm. and and Grok is they're they're a competitor to OpenAI, which I find interesting because he was an early founder of OpenAI and he got out because it seems like he thinks they're evil. Um. They weren't being open enough. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Elon thinks they're evil. Well, there's a there's a debate <laughs> about this, and I haven't really taken sides on it, but some people in the community think that OpenAI is now pretty closed, and they are likely to be the ones who create the uh, most powerful technology. And when things mm. are closed, it gets concentrated into the hands of a few powerful people. But if it was open source, right. at least everybody right. would get it, which gives you a fighting yeah. chance. That's the right. philosophy. So he decided to make his own company called called XAI, and Grok is what they released. And it's <laughs> from a product perspective, it's it's pretty weird. Um, it's a is it trained on Twitter? Yeah, is it trained on tweets? <laughs> yeah, it sounds like so. People are saying that they bought access to. They trained it in like four months, probably using a training data set that they purchased and also Twitter. Huh. So it's really crass. It'll tell you, it'll, it'll give you like very offensive answers. It'll answer spicy questions that you wouldn't get an answer from, from GPT. Wow. And it will, it will say very offensive things. <laughs> so does this have legs? It can, should we take this seriously? Like, is it going to evolve into something useful? Well, that's the, th- so he's, he calls it a very early beta product with the rebellious streak and it's only for verified X members right now. Mm. Can we take it seriously? I mean, <laughs> so in other words, you got to pay $8 to prove your identity. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> $8 a month. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I guess my answer is this, I couldn't use this in production, you know, no. like when, when we're <laughs> – I there can't be a chance that if I'm generating content for a customer, it tells you to do the kinds of things that I see it telling people to do on Twitter. Mm. So um, it's an interesting idea. Um, what will it turn okay. into? No one knows. Yeah. Um, something going on in China? 
some Chinese open source project? Yeah, uh, Kai Lee, Kai Fu Lee um, revealed uh, a chat GPT rival called Yi 34B. It's competitive with three point, uh, GPT 3.5. It's open source, apparently. And um, he wants to create an open AI equivalent for China. So that's what that's about. How does the Chinese government l- allow that to happen? I mean, that doesn't seem like a very Chinese government-y thing, does it? Open source? No, no. I mean, they, they block Google, right? They block everything. How are they going to give anybody access to an artificial intelligence that knows everything? Well, I would expect that it would be very pro-China. Yeah. They got to have some serious guardrails. Yeah. It's going to be yeah. – my understanding has been that China is actually has actually fallen a little bit behind in this race because they've mm-hmm. been so conservative with safety. In other words, censored. <laughs> yeah, and and I think yeah. this is probably going to be a super safe, partially lobotomized, very pro-China <laughs> LLM. We'll see. Yeah, sort of the anti-Elon. <laughs> <laughs> the anti Elon. Yeah, the that's interesting. Rock. In the same way this thing came out that we'll tell you to <laughs> I'm actually not even gonna repeat it here. <laughs> no, uh, don't say it. <laughs> <laughs> and this other thing came out that's probably gonna constantly steer the conversation back towards the glorious People's Republic of China. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh other other things this week. Um Amazon and Samsung also entered the race. So mm-hmm. we talked about how Olympus, Amazon Olympus is rumored to be a two trillion parameter model. And mm-hmm. Samsung announced GOS, um, which is an LLM where part of it can run locally on devices. Whoa. Which is interesting for That's privacy. a Gauss, like G A U S S, right? Oh yeah, Gauss. Gauss. Like, I don't know how you pronounce it, but that's how it's spelled G A U S S. Yes, that is that is probably the more correct. Um so it's it's interesting. We'll see, you know, uh What's interesting this week is that there was nothing so far from Google Gemini, which is supposed to be there. It's their much anticipated model. Yeah. So Google kind of pulled a Xerox here and invented this technology and then just let it drift out of their control because they were so focused on search and this seemed like if anything would be disruptive to search. So this is the first I've heard of Google Gemini. I know about BARD. What's the difference? Uh, I think I think Gemini is a bigger, badder model. and it's supposed to be a GPT-4 rival or GPT-4 killer. But mm. at this point, there's huge pressure on them. And what I'm seeing from just sort of chatter on the internet is mm-hmm. that people are starting to wonder if their culture is going to allow them to to do this. Like, mm. will they be able to release something that keeps up with OpenAI? And can they sustain another kind of lackluster release? Well, what you were saying about the moat, uh, you know, at Google that they have, you know, that what they said, they have no moat. So, so, so this is uh, the stuff that we were talking about is open AI's moat, but Google still doesn't have a moat. That's what you're saying. Yeah. Well, if they have a moat, it's barred connecting to it's enterprise search. It's barred connecting mm. to all of your G suite information, mm-hmm. which is a pretty good moat. I mean, yeah, it's that's, pretty good. That's pretty good. I think that was their initial answer to it. Um, right. And good on them. I think it's, that is good tech. Um, mm-hmm. This I think is supposed to be like a, like infrastructure for other people to use through an API. And yeah. They're going to need to have – like what OpenAI has done this week is released a bunch of things around the model that make it easier to use, better to use, uh, removes mm. all these difficult engineering obstacles. Gemini is going to have to do that now. Like how do you <laughs> how do you say yeah. you're on par with GPT-4 without something like the assistance API? Brian, if you could sum up the week in AI – in five words or less, what is it? Mine is holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I can do that. But the theme is the themes are more competition, which is good for everybody, and more abstraction, which is great for developers. That's way more than five words. 
That's okay. I think more abstraction. More abstraction, more power, I think is a good way to say it, huh? Yeah, more abstraction, more power, more competition. Very good. All right, we'll see you next week on the AI Bot Show podcast. Thanks. Thanks for listening. (laughs) 